Retirement looks good on you, Professor. So relaxed in your farm. Well, just like President Obasanjo retired to his farm. What informed this choice of retirement to your farm, Professor? Okay, I, I must tell you that something, something tickled me many years ago when the conditions of service in the tertiary institutions were so bad and I had seen my very, 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 very senior colleagues retiring and uh, not being as ebullient as they were a few months after retirement, I got challenged that I didn't want to uh, spend the last days of my life like that. And that was when I started preparing for my retirement. This is about 20 years ago. That means at about age 50, I had, I had started preparing for my retirement at age 70. And that was where I started putting everything I ever earned into, into this farm. Uh, I want to be close to nature, like we are here now. We are very close to nature. And uh, whatever I want to eat in the farm, I will get it from the farm. Whatever I want to eat in this farm, I will get it from here. You see your birds growing, your pigs delivering. This, when I came, uh, my attender was telling me, ah, that's the good news. Uh, there were three, three, three piglets were delivered this morning. I was very, very excited as if I was going to eat them. And uh, going around alone is enough exercise, that's true. And then eating what you want to eat, which is natural, is also another blessing to me. So one, I prepared for retirement. I promised myself that at retirement, I should not anything anything less than my terminal salary as a professor. Till, till God decides to, to call me. It was a challenge I gave to myself. And by God's grace, I think, by and large, one has arrived there. Um, but I must confess this, that all my life, there has been the hand of God guiding me. Where the hand of God was guiding me to, I wouldn't know at the beginning. But at the terminal point, at the different terminal point, I would just smile and say, this is actually where God was guiding me to. So God has faithfully guided me up to this point and uh, uh, until I pass on I think I will be full of thanksgiving to God for what he has done in my life. Farming is natural to me considering my environment. My, my father is, was Uweru, my mother was Aviara, two, two farming communities and growing up as a child I lived with my eldest brother Elder Ben Mogere, thank God for his life, still alive, at uh, the rural training center Anwa Asaba. Uh, while I was with him, that was when I wrote the common entrance exam in 1966 that got me into Federal Government College Worry in 1967. So I actually left Anwa Asaba for, for Worry for secondary school education. But for this useless civil war, you know, I would never have left. I would never have left that place. Uh, but I had to. And so that was where I got the rudiments of the rudiments of farming and the love for farming. Uh, the other place was purely farm. A Greek research, a Greek everything. They produced what they wanted to consume or they produced what they consumed. And uh, that's what I've copied over the years. I want to produce what I consume. And I do produce what I consume in this farm. There's a lot doing, uh, like we would say in the Anglican church, and it is marvelous in our sight. Beyond farming for personal consumption and leisure, the little documentary I've seen the case that what you have ongoing there, Professor, is beyond just personal consumption and leisure. Initially, initially it was yeah, perhaps it was a passion, hmm, part time, while I was working. But I now saw that with time, every cobra I earned was going into it. You have so many ponds. There's a need for more ponds. There's a need for more ponds. And you continue putting in. And you cannot have so many beds and depend on the feed, or the, on, on, on the feed millers to supply you feed because all your earnings will go to the feed millers while I have the capacity and the knowledge to process my own feed. So I, I conquered that. Uh, and I saw that, okay, I could produce more than I needed. So you, you give some out by way of sale and all of that. That's where we are now. But for right now, I'm not processing eggs for sale. 
neither am I processing uh, broilers for sale, but there will be broilers for sale in December. What I have on ground now are parent stock of broilers. That is, the, I get the fertilized eggs from there and hatch them. I like demysi demystifying things. Tell you where you have the hatchery, you remove your shoes, put your leg in a, in a treated water before you enter, if not the eggs and the beds will, will deteriorate and blah, 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 blah. All that one I big just they sh that should they just to threaten you, right? These things have been made too simple, too simple. The the birds you saw there, the turkey you saw there, were hatched by me. You were while serving as a commissioner, right there in my commissioner's quarters. So if I could do it at such small scale, those who have money can do much much better than that, much better than that without the involvement of government. Uh, later on in this interview, I will tell you what government must do to farmers and those in the agro like there. Agri-allied industry. So you are correct. It has gone beyond what I would need for consumption. If it was just for consumption, I would not need more than one acre. I certainly would not need more than one acre. But this farm is sitting on about uh, 50 acres or thereabout, uh, modestly speaking. It's sitting on about 50 acres or 50 something acres. So waking up in the morning and going around, see your cocoa, process, or observing the processing cocoa, wine from the cocoa, and then see your cotton. When I see people picking cotton in the early afternoon or joining them in picking cotton, I just get so, 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 so relaxed. So it's beyond consumption now. I can give some out, oh, trade by butter. Maybe I give you some fish, you give me something else. Uh, <laughs> you give me some, I give you, I give you cotton, you give me cotton seed oil, or I give you granite cake. Uh, you give me something else, or you give me cash, right? So I'm not a rich man, but I can tell you I'm a wealthy man. Hmm? I'm not rich, but I'm wealthy. And it is God's grace that I am that wealthy. What you call wealthy may not be what I call wealthy. So don't go say, Brother Boga is a very wealthy man. He's like Hebrew. I'm not like that. To me, eh, I have enough wealth. Uh -huh. God has, God, I always mention God. God has provided for me and my immediate family. God, by his own grace, has provided it. So I'm, that's why I'm always happy. Every day to me is celebration of God's goodness in my life. You retired recently as a lecturer, Professor, and you just left the state cabinet. It's not all the time we see this kind of mood in people. How would you describe what is going into that? seems a little more mysterious to some of us. How will you describe what is keeping you in this state of mind? I told you earlier that the heart of God has always guided my life. And um, let me make this point at this time. Maybe I'll go back to it later. The governor has been a friend pre his senior days, right? Pre his being SSG. So we have known and we are still friends. Since, uh, since I left the cabinet, we have, we have discussed. Eh? As we had discussed it before I became commissioner. There's something about being a commissioner. When you appointed a commissioner, particularly by a friend, it, there's, there's immediately a glass wall between two of you. That casual relationship ceases to exist. It becomes official. I suffered it under Oduaga. I also suffered it under Ifan Yoko. Right, it's now strictly boss to subordinate. Whereas, if I became commissioner, I could call uh, my then principal, uh, Governor Ima Oduaga, 11 p.m., midnight, and his talk. But the moment I became commissioner, you wait for him to send for you. <laughs> so I couldn't walk into Governor Oduaga as I used to walk to him before I became commissioner. Same thing with Ivan Yokoa. The moment I became commissioner is now communication, three SSG, three head of service, three chief of staff, you want to see me, you have to be booked. So is it the same person I used to call and say I'll walk through, right? But God was preparing you for something else. Even though that period I was in government, four years with uh, Governor Dwagan, four years in um, Governor Kowa's first tenure, three years plus in Kowa's uh, second tenure again, God was preparing me for something. And God also knew what it has cost me to invest in this farm. He knew. And how my personal attention would be needed and also how I needed some rest. I've worked continuously from age 29 without actually taking a break. 
and there is need to take a break. There are other things to do. There are other ways of serving government and all that. So exiting the university in May 29, and exiting um, government was it on the second or the second, second. Uh, you, may, you may look at this as being funny, and I interpreted it as this: is how God wants it to be, wind down, take a rest. If other things are going to come, let them come. And since that time, the quality time I've spent in my farm has yielded dividend. Has yielded dividend. Moved production from somewhere to this. This one I was using that facility. Now I have enough facilities in this farm. Or God has provided enough facilities in this farm. So living exco, it's not living government. My eyes are still very much monitoring the institutions as if I am still commissioner for higher education. I report now directly to Governor Ifan Yoko. I don't need to go to SSG, right? Don't need to go to chief of staff or head of service or any member of the kitchen cabinet, right? I straight to him. This is what should be done, this is what should be done, this is what should be done. I'm not the one to tell the commissioner what I feel should be done. It's left for the, uh, the governor to tell the commissioner for higher education. I think this is the pol policy direction of this government. That's such. So it is a very wake up development that I am for now away from the rigors of bureaucracy. Right? Do this, write this memo in a very monotonous, monotonous language. Besides, write it this, this, and that. No more now, it's direct. So if I feel anything um, is going amiss in government, I will call the governor directly and tell her, hey, this is not it. It, cannot, it will not work like this. And I will say it authoritatively, right? Believing that whatever I'm saying is to help a friend. And when you are doing something to help a friend, you say it directly, you not with tongue in the cheeks. So that's where we are, having left government for about a week plus now. I don't know if you can hear me, Professor. It appears to be raining out there. I'm going to come back to policy initiatives in education, but let's go to prevailing political discussions in Delta State. In our last conversation, in this state, that Governor Kowa did not anoint any gubernatorial aspirant in Delta State. Are you still holding on to that narrative, Professor? Yes. I maintain that, that the governor had no preferred aspirant for, for the position of governor of Delta State from the PDP. It did not, it does not, that I know of. But there is nothing wrong with governor C. It started from Iboris time. There's this concept of governor C. Now governor talks C. There are people around me who see the governor far less than I see him, but give the impression to the public that they live in the governor's, not in the office, but in his main house. And they are not 10 miles near the governor's office or house. So those are the ones we refer to as governor C. There are very many governor C on this matter. And I don't believe in governor C. Neither do I believe in reading uh, indeterminate body languages, uh, reading lips like that. I'm not a lips reader, neither am I a mind reader. But what I can tell you for free is that on the floor of ESCO, the governor openly declared, and I believe that today, that for those members of the executive council who would want to contest various positions, not just governorship, should be, please feel free to approach me, either openly or come to me. And they did. Or met him either to go to House of Reps to seek his blessing, to go to House of Assembly, to go to Senate, to become governor. And he blessed them. The position of governor is like that of a pastor. You go and meet your pastor that I want to do this venture and all that. Pastor tells you to kneel down and let me bless you. The pastor must bless whoever comes to him. And so Governor Ifa Yokoa blessed whoever came to him. And I threw the challenge to all those who came to him. Whether they went to him and he did not bless them. So I believe he blessed them. But I also have my own mind. He has blessed many of them. Let me think, let me think of who I will bless extra. I have the one I have blessed extra as Patrick Bobogar, yes. I've blessed him extra. So I added my blessing to the governor's blessing, which he already got. There was one of them even 
Who boasted I was not there when the event occurred or the events occurred? Who boasted that um, Governor Iko Ifanyokowa had, had endorsed him for governorship and that Governor Ifanyokowa's father had also endorsed him for governorship? He didn't mention the governor's wife, but he mentioned the governor and his father. So he had already got family blessing. I know he cried and cried and cried when the governor's father died, right? Because two of them uh, anointed him. He crashed. Yeah, he crashed. Of all that were anointed by the governor, um, all crashed but one. Do that one is in court. Yeah, the outcome is key in our, in our movement forward. So there, there's, there's no one person anointed. But this governor say, governor say, is this one, is this one. I won't mention this, but I know he anointed all of them. So maybe to House of Assembly. So maybe to House of Reps. But what I do not like about those anointed is that after failing, they will come and complain that uh, governor encouraged me to, co to contest so I didn't know it was encouraging the other person to contest too. What does that tell you? The governor was behaving like a pastor who will bless everybody. Abi, the pastor must bless everybody. So he blessed everybody, all but one, temporarily succeeded, and uh, the outcome is being awaited. The outcome is being awaited. So I still believe, I still believe that the governor did not anoint anybody, right? I'm close enough to know. He did not mention anybody to me that he anointed. Perhaps, even if he had somebody in mind, he might have thought that uh, I do not have enough political sagacity eh? to be told that somebody is the anointed person or he didn't trust me enough. But I do not believe that he does not trust me enough. I think he trusts me enough. And I take it from what he said. I can't go into him to bring out what he did not say. What he told us was that whoever came to me, he would, I would advise and then bless him, thank him for exiting the ESCO. So there's no member of the ESCO, for example, quite a number of them contested. There's no member of the ESCO who left on account of contesting that did not receive the blessing of the governor. So if anybody is contesting among them, the outcome of the elections or the outcome of the primaries, the person is not fighting the governor. Certainly not fighting the governor because the governor had or has no preferred aspirant. If you hear that theme, we are parrying.